everybody. We are here live with Dr. Stephen Porges. Uh, Dr. Porges, thank you so much for being on Brain Chat again. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much for inviting me. I look forward to seeing what we're going to discuss. So lead the yeah. way. Okay, absolutely. So we've, um, you know, I, I've become good friends with Dr. David Hanscom, who um, is a retired orthopedic spine surgeon, and he stumbled upon your work, and you guys have been doing some work together. Mm -hmm. And he told me just some of the work that you were doing regarding the pandemic and polyvagal theory. So I wanted to touch on a little bit of that tonight. But for people that are new and don't know much um, about the vagus nerve and polyvagal theory, could you just give us a brief synopsis on that? Yeah, very quickly stated. Uh, we have an autonomic nervous system, which is the nerves that regulate the organs of our body. Uh, the nerves start off in our brain. So we're really talking about uh, brain-body connection. And this becomes very critical as we evolve from that because we've learned, or I shouldn't say we've learned, we've been uh, uneducated over, over decades, perhaps centuries, to think that we have a nervous system of the brain and a nervous system of the body. But we really have one nervous, integrated nervous system that talks back and forth. In fact, the status of our body influences what we can access in our brain. And all of you who have had visceral or bodily pain realize that your intellectual and your emotional regulation is compromised when your body's not feeling well. So polyvagal theory is all about the body and the autonomic nervous system, the nervous system of the viscera, and how that being in different states affects how we live our lives, how we feel, how we interact, how we process, you know, how we engage each other. And this system is basically a neural system that evolved as mammals evolve from more primitive vertebrates on a pathway or journey to sociality. So what that really means is mammals had to turn off their defenses to come close to each other. While other vertebrates had a very well-developed system to detect threat. Mammals have that, but mammals have something else. They have a nervous system that detects safety and trust in others. And that down-regulates all these defensive physiological states. And polyvagal theory talks about how different physiological states support different adaptive behaviors, like behaviors of safety when we're safe, when we're in danger, or when we're in life threat. And it also provides an understanding of how therapies can work, how they can downregulate threat. So the discussion with uh, David Hansom has all been about downregulating threat responses because he is very focused and interested in chronic pain. Being a spinal surgeon, that was his focus. And people were coming in for spinal surgery because of pain. And he basically realized that most surgeries fail, meaning they are, uh, in a sense, well done, they're executed, but they fail in removing pain. And then he found out through his own interactions that as he talked to his patients and interacted with them, they became pain-free. And then he said, hey, try to figure this out, then he landed on polyvagal theory. And polyvagal theory explains that you shift physiological states to downregulate defenses when you're in this way, you feel safe with another and trust. So social interaction changes our physiological state. But with pain, we have to think of pain as being part of our defense system. It's so obvious. It's part of our defense system. And chronic pain, and people always will say, well, I was stressed out that day and my pain really came back. Well, of course it would because when you're stressed out, you're shifting physiological state. You're going into a physiology that supports threat and not a social one. So you're losing the attributes of a new mammalian ventral vagal circuit that has this wonderful capacity to coordinate our more mobilized sympathetic nervous system and our very ancient dorsal vagal system that runs our gut. And when this newer ventral one, which is really primarily regulating our heart and our bronchi, uh, enables us to, uh, in a sense, calm our heart down, it also contains or constrains the sympathetic nervous system and keeps the dorsal vagus out of defense. And that supports health growth and restoration. So now 
in a very short way, you've learned all about polyvagal theory and about the power of social interaction as a basically a regulator of our physiology. So no longer can people say it's all in your head or they can think of social behavior as being oblique and unrelated to physiology. It's all one. Our nervous system as humans, our nervous system even with our mammalian uh, relatives, it's all about co-regulation. Think of the baby, the baby is born. So and can't take care of themselves as opposed to reptiles that hatch on their own, get out of the shell and scamper off to do whatever they're going to do. Humans need other humans. We are a connected species and that connectedness is part of our biology. Yeah, when, and when I stumbled upon polyvagal theory, I was working with patients um, that suffered from brain injuries. So concussions, traumatic brain injuries. And I realized uh, once I started implementing some of your work into the therapies or what I thought I was implementing in, I started to realize that um, looking into the vagus nerve and vagal tone and trying to understand uh, the health of the vagus nerve is foundational in a lot of healing processes. Yeah, but we want to be real careful. We don't want to give attributes to a nerve. A nerve is just Sorry. like a wire. It's connecting the brain to the object or the organs. And when you're saying we want to make sure that the vagus is doing its job, we really want to say that information from the brain is going to the organs and information from the organs is going back to the brain as part of a feedback system that supports what has classically been called homeostatic functions, supporting health growth and restoration. And when you're working with individuals with uh, traumatic brain injury, they have overlapping symptoms with PTSD, but part of it is they're chronically under threat because they don't know if they're going to recover. So we have to understand what medicine or medical practice does. It's really assessment. Most of what people go into medical facilities for is to get assessments. And what that really means is they're being evaluated. Now think for a moment about evaluation and threat. So going into a medical facility, getting this test or getting that test is putting the nervous system into a state of threat, which does not support health, growth, and restoration. So we have it, as my, as my friend David would say, we have it backwards. And now he wants to use the word uh, disintegrate, disintegrative medicine for what medicine is commonly practiced. But what he's saying, and it's very polyvagal informed now, is that uh, we have to feel safe in the environment to be accessible for and welcoming to any type of treatment, whether it's pharmaceutical, whether it's behavioral, and even whether it's surgical. In one of your papers, uh, you mentioned um, the saying survival of the, the fittest mm -hmm. versus survival of the ones who were able to co-regulate and um, yeah. socially engage. Yeah, it's like we have something totally misunderstood. We talk about survival of the fittest as being physically stronger, dominating. We see this even in politics and in warfare, but the survival of mammals, and we go through evolution and mammals evolve from ancient primitive, uh, they evolve from reptiles. And when they evolved, they were very small. They were functionally food for the reptiles, but they communicate with each other and they cooperated. So they can be the gentlest but through cooperation, they can survive. And there's a very important message there, and that is to understand that mammals are connected species. So we as humans need to connect. Absolutely. Um, can you touch a little bit, before we go into the pandemic um, and polyvagal theory, can you just touch a little bit on the safe and sound protocol? Sure. Um, over the past couple of decades, I developed an acoustic intervention, which literally, I viewed it almost like a stealth intervention. How do you deliver cues of safety to the nervous system without, uh, in a sense, uh, out the person being aware of it? Now, people who are good in social interactions are people that I call super co-regulators, meaning they change other people's physiology based on their presence. There are certain attributes they have. 
They talk with uh, intonation in their voice. They have gestures, their face works. So people feel comfortable in their presence. Now, if we think about vocalizations and we think about a mother's uh, lullaby or a mother talking to her baby, and we can see a baby who is in a state of a tantrum or crying, suddenly just become relaxed and start smiling really rapidly when the mother uses her intonation of her voice. We can see fathers not doing so well with their kids, but very well with their dogs using the prosodic voice with the dog. And suddenly the dog is like this, you know, safe and feeling good. So in my mind, I said, can I deliver an acoustic stimulus that the body can't refuse? Can I literally extract a dis the distilled essence of trust from vocalizations and put it into a, uh, a protocol that people would just listen to? So there's a series of algorithms in which vocal music was processed to modulate frequencies uh, that so there are people are singing and then there's a variety of filters that are put on what the, the music is. And those filters are really following an algorithm based to trigger on triggering uh, the neural, okay, it gets complicated at this point, the neural <laughs> regulation of the middle ear muscles, which are part of the regulation of the social engagement system, which is linked to the vagus. So functionally, listening to prosodic music or prosodic voices uh, functions like a vagal stimulator. So social engagement is calming to others. But what does calming mean? It means that the vagus, at least the newer mammalian vagus, is now starting to work. It's starting to calm us down. And people are getting is it's more resilient or more contained. So that's what the Safe and Sound Protocol, it's a five uh, hour five one hour sessions of which the modulation is it's a training program metaphorically you could say it's like uh going on a treadmill for your middle ear muscles but there are a lot <laughs> of consequences of it that is auditory hypersensitivities are are dampened people are no longer auditorily hypersensitive and when that physiology changes even their visual hypersensitivity decreases and they are now spontaneously engaging others, autonomically they're calmer. Now, this works extraordinarily well with uh, children who uh, might be a little bit on spectrum, autistic spectrum or language delayed. But when you start bringing people in to use this intervention who have severe trauma histories, because traumatized individuals want to be engaged, but their bodies say no. And this is where it gets interesting from a clinical perspective and also from a science perspective, that if you give cues of safety to someone who has a severe trauma history, the cues of safety will start off by do, their bodies will open up and relax. But if you have a trauma history and your body becomes accessible, it means you're vulnerable. So the initial response is, oh. the next response is this. So the insightful trauma therapists have been titrating this intervention and making remarkable progress with, with their clients. So if you have a trauma-informed safe and sound protocol provider, they're, they're often trained in areas like somatic experiencing or EMDR or uh, internal family systems. And what they're using the safe and sound protocol to is to initially calm the body and then move on and then go back to it later. So they, they spread it out over several weeks to, to get the same effect. And the, the word back from the clinicians is that it's accelerating treatment by a lot. Yeah, that's great, great stuff. And um, so with the COVID-19 pandemic still uh, in effect to this day, um, I guess, who would have thought, you know, we, we would still be out wearing masks so almost nine months later. Um, could we talk a little bit about the effects yeah. of COVID-19 on uh, the yeah. polyvagal and, and with the polyvagal theory and social engagement? Um, yeah, we, we, let's, let's talk on the optimistic side. Um, sure. 
things are changing. There is a vaccine. Um, <laughs> and I always want to feel that we have to have a direction. And we also have a change in administration in the United States. And that will that change is a change that will have a plan. Our nervous systems really fall apart in chaos. We don't mind difficult problems as long as we have a plan. We'll, we'll get there. And we're going to have a plan. And I think there'll be a large change in the population and how they behave. Because the chaos creates threat. Threat does not allow connectedness to occur. It interferes with social engagement. So I just want to put that on the table. In terms of the safe and sound protocol, they start to deliver it remotely with an app. And so you, you can actually assign a, a user or a, a client using the app, and then you can do video conferencing with that. And it was uh, since the, I think the end of April, they delivered 120,000 treatment sessions with the app. And I just, all I could do is smile because uh, in my world, uh, as a academic and a, in a sense, a laboratory scientist, the greatest frustration is not having your ideas or your products uh, useful to people in a sense they remain in the laboratory because we don't know how to get them out there. And to me, uh, this has just been a wonderful, uh, for me, transformative period of time. Now let's get to COVID. COVID tells us who we are. COVID and this isolation has really explained to the human, to the human, through our own experiences, who we are. Do we, uh, do we really want more stuff or do we want relationships? So what the pandemic has done is has with, uh, put us in a situation where we now value the importance of interacting with people and with our family, with our children, with our, those who are close to us, our friends, and we hurt because we don't see that. So what the pandemic teaches us, it teaches us what we value. And the other part is, it, and I wrote a paper on this, I viewed it as a paradoxical challenge to our nervous system. Why? because the pandemic is a real threat. Real threats shift our nervous system into states of defense. And through the evolution of mammals, when they are in states of defense or threat, how do they mitigate that threat? Through social interaction. But during the pandemic, social interaction is a threat. So now we have to be smart and we have to utilize whatever tools we have, including this one, this video conference I did. So I actually talk about that in the, that article. And uh, the, the, it's an interesting point because I and, I, and I talk about this frequently. The first thing I started to do while video conferencing during the pandemic was to wear glasses. I normally don't wear glasses. Well, why am I wearing glasses? I can see the upper parts of people's faces. I can see them more crispy, more clear. And so I'm actually more engaged. The other part that I've really learned is that it tends to be energetic to do uh, interaction, even doing through, uh, through video chatting, because you're still connecting with another. It's not the same as I, the metaphor I frequently use is having a cup of coffee at Starbucks or having a drink where you just sit down and you talk and time doesn't matter. You're just enjoying it, but it's really better than nothing. And uh, it keeps us connected with one another. And it's a, it's a reasonable, let's use the term placeholder. You mentioned in the paper that although we're going through the pandemic at this time, we do have access to the video conferences yeah. and the Zoom chats and the importance of that versus texting um, due yeah. to, you know, the social engagement, the facial interaction, intonation. Yeah. So well, well, um, let's go back to texting. Texting irritates a lot of people because... <laughs> It irritates them not because they don't like it, but because people don't respond rapidly enough. So we tend to, I used to ask the question uh, when I give workshops, 
How long can you wait before you really get irritated if you don't get a response to your text? And it's usually in, in the window of 20 minutes, people really can't take it. And it's really up because they have engaged and our nervous system is requesting reciprocity, a reciprocal behavior, and that's getting violated. But we have it with the video, we have re reciprocity. And, and that's important. I also talk about the fact that we have learned to use two-dimensional screens as entertainment or education. And when they're normally on, we multitask. And now we have to stop that. So when I'm talking to you, I can't do this. I can't go to work like that because it will affect your nervous system. And in the real, real world, before COVID, people would do that all the time. They would insult people by turning away and say, don't worry, I'm listening to you. I can hear what you're saying. That's not exactly true. I mean, we, we, we're certainly, the power of our intentionality in a social interaction is extremely important to the other because it shifts their physiology and we have to respect that. So I was going to say that my, when I was a, a little boy, my, uh, my father built our first television set. I'm, I'm, it gives you an estimate of how old I really am. He actually got it as a kit and put it together. And I'm this little boy and he puts it together in the living room. And it's basically, it's a chassis, metal chassis with tubes and the antenna is sitting in the living room. And he's turned and we see these people moving around. And he says to me, he says, you know, people are going to develop some really bad habits. They're going to start talking while other people are talking. So the initial, of course, response was when the TV's on, no one talks. But what happens is that it's the same as a two-dimensional screen. When the, when the two-dimensional screen is on, you multitask. Now we have to, we have to break that habit and literally squeeze this modality for what we can get out of it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's just great information. And um, I don't wanna keep you too much longer, but for, for some of our followers, uh, they're, they're always looking for ways to increase their resilience. Do you have just one or two little gems that you could kind of leave us with to, to continue to make it through um, until we reach the light at the end of the tunnel? Well, you know, uh, this it's a lot of responsibility to kind of come up with a gem or two. But we're, we're, you know, the gift we have is that we can breathe and we have to realize that breathing is a accessible portal to regulating our bodily state, regulating our vagus. Our calming vagus gets really uh, functional when we exhale slowly. And when we inhale, we tend to dampen it or turn it off. So a neural exercise that would improve our vagal tone and our resilience would be to take a few minutes and exhale slowly, take a deep breath, exhale slowly, do this multiple times. Now, uh, when I reflect on that, I had a history when I was very, when I was a teenager and actually, yeah, teenager in our early twenties of being a clarinetist, I played the clarinet. And the clarinet uh, is about taking a quick in-breath and a very long out-breath. And there'll be people who are singers who are on or wind, other wind instruments. And they will say, well, you know, I've always noticed that when I sing or when I play my, the wind instrument, I calm down. Now, when I talk that, about that, you know who gets upset? The keyboard players, the string players, and the percussionists, they said, we do the same thing. What they're saying is we breathe with the phrasing of the music. And what does that mean? It means you exhale slowly. So this is, so the take home jam is breathe with the phrasing of the music, exhale slowly. Thank you. And, and congratulations on the app. I know that there was no better time for something like that to happen for people during this pandemic. And Thank you so much for all the continued research that you do and the work that you do. We're all very grateful, I can say, on the clinical side and on the patient side as well. So thank you so well, much. Thank, well, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me onto this webinar and enjoyed seeing you again for a few years.